or removal of the dead skin. Everybody's skin has a buildup and it needs to be removed frequently. This helps to keep the skin clear, fresh, and most important, it works to providing a solution to ingrown beard hair, which a lot of men suffer from. So always have a facial scrubbing done at your next trip to the barber shop, or you can do it yourself at home as part of your self-care. It is then washed off carefully with special attention being paid to the eye area and the nose where there's usually an accumulation of dead skin. Moisturizer is very important to lock in much needed moisture. Most men tend to neglect this part of skincare and this leads to them having dry skin. With a perfect haircut, polished skin and good shoes, anyone can be a perfect gentleman. This has been Self-Care Tips. I am Irene Joroge. Take it on at the right time. Honorable Musalia Mudavadi. The Honorable Mutahi Kagwe. Chief Justice Martha Karambuko. This is KBC. He's yes. the voice of Kenya. Asking the right questions. I don't know how it made you feel a speaker who is presiding over a house where members can be compromised with 10,000 shillings. We keep our guests comfortable. A mission to ensure our audience gets a complete story. For a few hours or so, I thought this is it. My end has come. If really we want an end of this pandemic, we must fight. Our goal, to tell it as it is for the benefit of our viewer. Uh, and I'm sure uh, we will have good discussions All right. uh, that will make probably your viewers mm. understand KDF better. Oh. With 21 radio outlets. During a live interview on KBC TV, Chief of Defense Forces, General Robert Kiboshi. Aji mkuu kwa mara ya kwanza katika maujiano yake ya kipeke na runinga ya KBC Channel 1. And two TV stations covering over 90% of the entire country. The message always gets home. KBC, the home of on-air TV interviews. are notified to report and surrender unclaimed financial assets to the Unclaimed Financial Assets Authority on or before November 1st, 2021. It is now easier to report and surrender. Visit www.holders.ufaa.go.ke and get started. Beat the November 1st, 2021 deadline. It's your turn. Pass the baton. Unclaimed Financial Assets Authority. Receive Safeguard reunite. Sauti ya Kenya. Ju milimani na hata mabundeni. Radio Taifa inatamba kutamba. Sasa unaweza kupokea matangazo ya Radio Taifa loud and clear popote ulipo Western Kenya. Radio Taifa sasa hao unaweza ukatupata kupitia Ukiwa Busia, Siaya, Vihiga, Mumias, Yala na maeneo yaliyoko karibu Radio Taifa inapatikana kwenye 104.5 FM na ukiwa Bungoma, Kakamega, Kiminini, Kipkaren na viunga vyake pata vipindi na burudani safi kupitia 92.3 FM Radio Taifa sauti ya Kenya
evening to you and thank you so much for creating time for us 13 days into the month of October, the year 2021. Not a very good night, especially in the sporting scene. We are mourning the death of Agnes T. Ropa, promising world marathon holder who died at only 25 years. So who killed her? We got details about this particular developing story, plus more that we got contained in our comprehensive news bulletin that comes 10 years after our Kenyan troops, the KDF, stepped foot into the enemy's territory in Somalia. John Jacob Curia had a sit down with Lieutenant Colonel David Wando. He will be bringing us that interview later on to tell us about the progress, the gains, the misses, and the hopes to restore sanity back in Somalia in this bulletin that begins right now but first here are the highlights a dazzling flame extinguished police hunt for killer of 25 year old marathon holder Agnes T. rope racing to meet target IEBC changes strategy on mass voter registration. Um, all stakeholders are on board and the ministry will take the lead in making sure that this implementation is done timelessly and the effect of it are felt by the Republic of, of Kenya citizens. And turning the heat on senior managers, Kenya power managers frustrating reforms warned of dire consequences. Welcome to the broadcast. Remember, you can be part of it at KBC Channel 1. Use the hashtag Prime Edition. I'm doing this together with Lance Odingo, our sign language interpreter. A little bit later on, Cynthia Nyamai will be bringing you the business news and uh, Karen Kibet on the sporting uh, scene. Now, let's begin this bulletin on a sad note. President Uhuru Kenyatta has led Kenyans in mourning rising long distance runner Agnes Jebet Tirop, calling on the police to expedite investigations in into her death. Tirop's body was found on Wednesday at her home in Iten, Elgeo Marakwet County. Iten OCPD Tom Makori, who led crime investigators at the scene, said the former World Cross Country champion was stabbed with a knife in the neck. The 25 year old was in the Kenyan team that participated in the delayed 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Police in El Geo Marakwet County, led by Iten OCPD Tom Makori, visited the scene where the body of Olympian Agnes Jebet Tirop was found. <laughs> Agnes, a two-time world championship bronze medalist in the 10,000 meters, was reported missing by her father on Tuesday night. So, he reported to the police. Wakaanza kuweka mikakati kumtafuta huyu ambaye alikuwa amesemekana amepotea. Lakini iko maneno ambayo ilitoka kwa jamii ya bwana yake Tirop ambao walisema ya kwamba bwana alikuwa amepigia wasasi akilia. Akielezea kwamba Mungu amsamee iko kitu ambao amefanya. Hiyo ikafanya askari kufanya uamuzi ya kwamba iende kwa huko chambo mbaya ibidi itawatumie mbinu zozote wapate kuingia nyumba ambao ni yake Tirop wakati waliingia ndani wamempata Tirop akiwa huko kwa kitanda damu iko chini ya kitanda initial investigations indicate she died as a result of a knife stab on the neck na tunajaribu kuamini kutokana na hiyo ilifanya apate hicho kifo chake bwana yake mpaka saa hii akipatikana ile tunaita preliminary investigation ya kuonyesha ya kwamba bwana yake ni kama amehusika kwa sababu apatikani hata sisi tv iko ndani so katika hali ya uchunguzi wakifungua hiyo na zile vitu zimepatikana kidogo kidogo basi Itasaidia. President Uhuru Kenyatta while leading the country in mourning the former world cross country champion described the 25 year old as a Kenyan hero and champion who
whose death is a big blow to the country's sporting ambitions and profile. The head of state directed the police to hasten the search for her killers, saying it is even more painful that Agnes, a Kenyan hero by all measures, painfully lost her young life through a criminal act perpetuated by selfish and cowardly people. Athletics Kenya in their message noted the country had lost a jewel who was one of the fastest rising athletics giants on the international stage thanks to her eye catching performances. Mtu mwenye kufanya hii kwa kulingana na sheria yetu ya Kenya na ya ulimwengu wote na kwa Mungu and labda apatikane na atibu ile kisheria otherwise uh, sana. What we are asking uh, our athletes and coaches, uh, especially those who are very close to us, um, uh, to, to become uh, so that we know uh, the reasons as to why such a heinous act um, uh, took place. In California three weeks ago, Tirop in third. Last month, Tirop made history by shaving 28 seconds off the long standing women only world record for 10 km at the Adizero Road to Records event in Germany. Kam Chemenzam for Prime Edition. He takes it there at the line, two meters ahead of Tirop, and the sand beaten in. Really sad story there. We condole with her friends and family and her colleagues in athletics and continue to remember her for decorating the athletic scene and, you know, just elevating our country's name in the global uh, scene. Let's uh, move on to other stories. The Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission is mobilizing youths in institutions of higher learning to enlist as voters by taking the registration booths to their doorstep. At the launch of the exercise at the University of Nairobi, IEBC Vice Chairperson Juliana Cherera say they hope to encourage as many youths as possible to acquire the document which will ensure they execute their constitutional mandate come August 9th next year. The commission says it's targeting 2 million youths before the closure of the registration on the 2nd of next month. Timothy Kipnosu with details of this report. The Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission on Wednesday pitched 10 at the University of Nairobi main campus to begin an ambitious drive of registering new voters. We have now come to you so that we make it easy for you to get registered. IBC Vice Chairperson Juliana Cherera revealed that the commission has also prioritized employment of the youth to oversee the ongoing voter registration exercise with a total of 14,000 currently deployed across the country. That we want it instilled in Kenyans that this is a continuous exercise that will not need to revamp and energize. That once you get an ID, you just go get registered as a voter. IBC Acting Chief Executive Officer Marjan Hussein promising to deliver a free, fair and credible elections in the next polls. I can tell you for sure that ours is also very, very mature. In fact, I think we have got competitive democracy in Kenya compared to others in Africa. So many others. Yeah, and therefore, it will be very, very sad to hear that the youth have actually taken a back seat. Uh, more often than not, we assure the youth that they are the leaders of tomorrow. But I think they should take charge of the leadership right away. And one of the best ways that we can uh, support them to do so is to ensure that they get uh, registered as voters. This even as universities and colleges students peace association of Kenya called on the government to ensure the youth are fully represented in all sectors of the economy. This is an exercise that uh, is geared towards making work easier for the young people who are in institutions of higher learning so that you can register in school and also vote at home. The vote is very important to us for now and we are saying that this is the time for the young people to make decisions about their life and the future of their district. The reason why we are partnering with IBC this time around is because we want to reach the students all over the country. As you know, this exercise, it is the first time this exercise is happening, and that's why we are doing it here. And um, 
we have to consider that uh, this time around we have young aspirants across the country. The reason why we are targeting young people to register is because we will vote for these young people. We are exposed now in the process of electoral participation. Why? We can easily access our vote since USPAC has enabled us to access it easily and we really appreciate it. Even as the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission continues with the ongoing exercise of registering Kenyans as voters, the most daunting task that awaits the Commission is wooing and convincing a huge number of youth who form 75% of Kenyan population to register and later on to participate in an electoral process. Timothy Kipnoso for Prime Edition Nairobi. Thank you, Timothy Ipnusu, for that report. Now, moving on, the government has spent over 1.2 billion shillings on relief food for counties hit by drought. Government spokesperson Cyrus Oguna says the government is seeking another 1.2 billion shillings to help sustain families affected by drought in the month of November. This even as schools in Turkana County registered a low turnout for the second term. It is the second day since Lorengo Primary School in Kakuma, Turkana County, opened its doors to learners for the second term. Unlike in many schools in urban centers, the turnout in this school that also hosts refugee learners is low with only 55 out of the 365 learners reporting to school. According to the school head teacher, the burden of hunger has forced many learners to opt to stay at home in search of something to put in their mouth, including wild fruits. And we see the reason behind is that uh, most of them come from families that hardly get food. So back at home there's no food and in school I don't have any food right now. So it becomes hard for them to come. So what they're doing, mostly I know some of them are in the bushes, taking the wild berries. Uh, because I've tried to find them out at, school, at their families, they were not there in the morning. However, the situation is different for the lower grade learners who have flocked the school as they are assured of a meal, courtesy of a school feeding program that targets ECD learners. Ni mekwa retuin kwa hii kwa hii shule wakati wa kufungua. Watoto always respond kama pekine chakula hakuna. Kwa sababu most of them who access chakula kwa maybe kwa kwa boma ni ngumu. But once wakisikia chakula imeletwa kwa shule, unapata wengi wengi wao wanaingia. Learners here are constantly on the move alongside their families in search of food and firewood for sale, a situation that has seen many miss the opportunity to get an education. This school has been targeted for three sub-projects and uh, it has benefited with uh, a kitchen and store. And uh, behind me, you can see there's uh, a class that under construction, but almost complete. So I would, uh, uh, would um, confidently say that women have benefited and uh, in our assessments they have uh, indicated that or given a feedback that uh, their children are benefiting and they are able to support uh, their needs in terms of uh, school fees or that. The sad tale of Turkana mirrors the situation across drought-hit counties with the government promising scaled up efforts to mitigate the impact of the drought. Government spokesperson Cyrus Oguna says already 1.2 billion shillings has been set aside for the month of October and similar amount is being mobilized for next month. The government is in the meantime calling on organizations and people of goodwill to chip in and aid in the efforts to provide relief assistance. Distribution of physical food is currently ongoing and for which this food that is being distributed is for the month of October only and it has cost the government uh, 1.2 billion to procure and it's for the month of October. Now for the month of November again another 1.2 billion has been set aside to be able to procure food uh, to be distributed and therefore this distribution wants to assure Kenyans that they should not panic because as government we're fully in control of the situation. With Turkana being among the counties most affected by the ongoing drought, the availability of food in schools has been a motivating factor with more and more learners enrolling to school in these rural areas. Nancy Okwari, Prime Edition from Kakuma, Turkana County.
All right, thank you, Nancy, for that report. Now, in 2011, Kenya made a bold move of deploying its soldiers to Somalia. Ten years later, John Jacob Curia sits down with Lieutenant Colonel David Wando to discuss, among others, the gains, the lessons, and the way forward. That interview coming up right after this particular break. Please don't go too far. Ten years since Kenya went into Somalia to word of the Al Shabaab, who were a threat to the sovereignty of the Republic of Kenya, went in as Lindanchi and then moved into Amisom. We are speaking to Lieutenant Colonel uh, David Wando, an officer who's been at the warfront, now in charge of the environment portfolio in the Kenya Defence Forces, and he joins us as we speak about the war in Somalia. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Karibu sana. Asante. Let's begin with the pride of a soldier who is going into the warfront to defend the sovereignty of the Republic of Kenya. How did you feel? I will tell you, uh, in the military, you are prepared for this from the moment you join Cadet, Cadet Course. And that is at the Kenya Military Academy. All the training, all the education that you undergo is geared towards defense of the country. And so in a moment like this uh, gets to you and you're called upon, it finds you ready and uh, it's a proud moment for a soldier mm -hmm. because this is not experiences that everybody gets to have mm -hmm. so for me this was a proud a proud moment to stand up and uh, act in defense of the country you get to somalia what are your expectations once you get there before we got to somalia you have to understand that uh, our operations were majorly intelligence led and so we had some bit of information and much of what we encountered was not really a surprise. And so I understood from uh, the intelligence briefings that we had gotten and from the briefings that we had as a combat team that we were going to a violent, uh, an area that was experiencing violent conflict, an area that was experiencing humanitarian crisis. And unfortunately, that is exactly what we got. Mm. You, you're going to get an enemy of course you have intelligence about them but probably were there other things you didn't expect obviously um in terms of operations and how the al Shabaab would react to your entry into somalia well there are a few things like for example when we entered somalia the roads were virtually non-existent and so this really hindered our movement and we covered a distance of 42 kilometers in eight days because we kept getting bogged down by poor road conditions and you have to remember this was during the rainy season however when we got to the objective uh, we fought well and we took the objective in no time this time it's operation linda nchi yes. and you don't have any other force that is supporting except our own kenya defense forces warding off the enemy tell us about the experience in this very first phase of a war so this as a platoon commander then uh, even though i had been appointed i had been appointed as a second in command and the administration officer of the bravo combat team going into somalia prior to that i had conducted several patrols and uh, within within the within the border for what we call close operations and so i had a bit of experience engaging with al-shabaab i had already had an encounter with them in a place called damasa and so but this was now a full-blown uh, full-blown war you know and we were going to protect the country and so um, when when uh, when we when we went there we were up to scratch uh, like i said we were prepared we have been preparing we had trained and so we were not uh, playing a guessing game we knew exactly what we wanted to do and we were very clear about our objectives going into Somalia. As a leader of a Bravo group, of course you're leading um, soldiers in this. The optimism of your officers, tell us a bit about that. The morale is quite high. 
and the morale comes from the moral component. Mm. When the force believes in what it is doing and the country is behind you and we have the will to fight, then of course the morale was high. And each and every one of us, I can, I can tell you this, uh, were looking forward to attaining the objectives and accomplishing the mission that had been uh, bestowed on us, that had been given to us. And so our morale was high and it showed in our actions. I remember that time, just as raised now, the amount of support you received from Kenyans as you went into Somalia. I'm just wondering about locals um, in Somalia. These are soldiers from Kenya coming into Somalia, obviously for stability, uh, to stabilize this country. Is that how the locals felt? How were you received by the locals in Somalia? War is a whole spectrum of not just uh, using kinetic forces, but also winning the hearts and minds. And of course, this is a foreign force coming in for the first time and you have uh, some of the people who are a bit skeptical about what it is you're going to do. Is this uh, one oppressive force replacing another? That is Al-Shabaab. But uh, we had the opportunity to interact with, local, with the locals and uh, uh, as you are aware, uh, the Kenya Defense Forces conducted uh, several uh, civ uh, civil military cooperation and uh, we offered aid to the civilians around the areas where we deployed. And subsequently, we won hearts and minds and the Somalis got to realize that our task there was not to oppress them, but rather to get rid of them. Tell us about your alliances with the uh, Somali National Army or even the local enforcement in terms of law and order, how you were able to cooperate with them. Again, like I'm saying, there's a foreign force in the country, but then you're working towards the same goal. How did you cooperate? Well, for the, for the Somali National Army, you have to remember that uh, we have also participated in their training. And so uh, their modus operandi, if I may say that, is somewhat uh, borrowed from the Kenya Defense Forces. And I have to say that we had quite a cordial relationship with them. We had a good understanding about how we would operate. We would cooperate in the various operations that we undertook with them. And uh, I have to say for the period that I was there, I actually saw them grow into, into conducting certain operations by themselves. Mm -hmm. Of course, initially they required the support of, K of the Kenya Defense Forces, but uh, as we conducted the operations and they learned from us, they got to understand how they could conduct some of them. And it was quite a pleasure working with them. Right. Initially, they appeared to be the target of Al-Shabaab attacks. Even when our forces were inside Somalia, uh, most of the times you would hear what they have targeted are the camps of the Somali National Army. Probably you can tell us how you were able to create a hedge around them uh, so that the attacks uh, minimize on their end and they're able to help you uh, probably logistically or in w one way or another uh, to fight the Al-Shabaab. So the thing about uh, the attacks on the Somali National Army army camps. You have to remember this, uh, in my estimation, were approaches by Al-Shabaab, first of all, to exploit what they perceived as a gap. A uh, gap in this instance is a weakness. So they thought that because the Somali National Army was still younger in the sense of when they were established and how long it took them to train, as compared to KDF, which was well equipped, well trained, they thought that they would exploit that gap and attack the, the weak point. And what we did is uh, after every attack, uh, we would do an assessment, we would make an assessment of where the weaknesses were, help the Somali National Army in improving their defenses, and subsequently they were able to repel the Al-Shabaab successfully. A rough terrain, bad weather, and then you're dealing with an enemy probably who has been parading themselves around that terrain and probably understand it better than you do. How are you able to repulse them? Well, as you have correctly pointed out, you are fighting on their home turf. And so there's a lot of catching up for the force to do. And for us, it was the learning curve was pretty steep because we really had to adapt to, to the new operating environment and respond appropriately. And by response, I meant, I mean, uh, obtaining the correct kind of equipment. You'd find that maybe some of the equipment we went with are not suitable for the terrain. So we kept changing as we went along. And we also learned our enemy very fast and we were able to adapt to a model that would repulse his way of fighting. Is that about our equipment? Is that about the training of our soldiers? Are you able to do that that quickly? Yes, and uh, you have to understand that uh, flexibility is one of the principles of war. You have to be flexible and you have to adapt fast. 
because if you do not then it means that you will always be a step behind the enemy and you want the enemy to be a step behind you or several steps behind you so for kdf uh, this was not really anything new for us because again i fall back to our training our training is such that we are taught to adapt and adapt fast so our leadership uh, we would consistently have this line of communication where the troops in the front in the front lines would give feedback that would go all the way to the leadership and inform the decisions that would subsequently be made and that would have an impact on the operations on the ground and that's how we were able to uh, learn the al-shabaab learn their tactics adopt to the to the model of fighting and surpass them even in their own terrain are there instances where you found yourself um, having to change your methods of operation or even you know logistical operations uh, obviously owing to you know how the Al Shabaab is responding um, to your works in Somalia yes you have to understand that the enemy is also not static mm. the enemy is also trying to be innovative to beat either your defenses or to beat your your tactics and so uh, for example I will tell you uh, uh, in the, in the beginning there were we, we would conduct our patrols in a certain way uh, using vehicles but then we realized that the al-shabaab had now acquired more powerful ieds and so what that would mean is we would study the terrain mm -hmm. and there are areas where we would disembark from the vehicles uh, do a foot clearance of the area and then in other areas where we assess that the threat is not as bad we would embark on the vehicles and so this was one of the, of the ways that we had changed our our tactics to suit the threat that we were facing on the ground All right. yes. and yet the most glorious moment was recapturing Kismayo from the hands of the Al-Shabaab how did KDF operate you know towards an, uh, an operational base in terms of you know the, work, the, the ones in control of the entire you know uh, Kismayo port and then KDF recaptures it uh, from the Al-Shabaab tell us about that experience and how you were able to achieve that as a Kenya Defense Forces well I can only speak I can only speak of that from from now a different angle because you have to understand that Bravo combat team was operating in the northern sector yeah. and Kismayo was taken in the southern sector but this was a proud moment for 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 not just the Kenya Defense Forces but for Kenya as a whole because I think the capture of Kismayo displayed to the region and the entire world that we have a capable force a force that is uh, capable to propagate good not just in the region but also through this action we showed that we are professional mm. that we have well-trained soldiers and we have uh, uh, modern day equipment that can conduct such kind of operation I'm sure you understand that uh, there are very few successful beach landings that have happened in the world mm. and as a Kenya Defense Forces soldier I have to say this is one of the success successful beach landings mm in the entire world not just in africa mm -hmm. in the entire world mm -hmm. yes let's talk about your personal um experience in a bit and yours is a story of courage and overcoming being a war hero but let's talk about that particular day when the incident happened um you were in an id attack yes i was in an id attack okay. this happened in uh on, on 27th of july 2011, uh, 2012. 2012 and I remember on that day we were supposed to conduct a logistical run for one of our forward operating bases in Fafadun so uh, I had briefed my soldiers in the morning and we had we had located a center called Shahad this was approximately 35 kilometers away from from Busar and that was going to be our meeting center prior to this of course we kept changing our plans just in case anything had leaked and we were sure that everything was watertight and so on this particular day after the briefing we embarked on uh, on our journey now to go and meet uh, the, the the team from Fafadun so that we could make the logistical exchanges but this was also doubling up as a patrol and you have your soldiers in town yes i had my soldiers in town right. so this was a whole convoy a convoy of about nine vehicles including two from the somali national army and so we we set off uh, on our journey and like i'd said the roads in somalia were virtually non-existent by this point and so there were several twists and turns but i remember specifically when we were coming out of a clear a, a certain a certain thicket and we were just about to enter a clearing i had this loud bang 
and the next thing I knew is I could feel the vehicle had been lifted and this was an armored personnel carrier that weighs several tons. Mm. It had been lifted off the ground and we were slammed back onto the ground and my the cabin where I was seated was filled with soot and sand and you could barely see anything. Let me cut you short. Just a bit. This is, a, this is how many minutes after you had left um, the area? This was actually approximately two hours after we had left. Uh, after we had left camp, because after we left. left yes, because okay. we left at around uh, uh, zero eight hundred hours, and the incident was happening at around ten ten thirty five hours. Okay. Yes, and so, mm -hmm. and so the uh, as as the soot and the dust had filled the the cabin, my mind first of all raced to my driver, and and you know things are happening lightning quick. Because at the same time, I'm trying to look over at my driver. I can feel my soldiers disembarking from the vehicle. This is our uh, is what we call our ambush drills. You're in this APC, and it is the one that you're in that is leading. Yes, this was the command vehicle, and it was the one that was leading. Okay. So, uh, my my soldiers disembark from the APC, and the dust settles enough for me to see my driver and the first thing I ask him is are you okay this uh, the driver is called sergeant Kito mm. so I ask him uh, Kito are you okay and he tells me he's okay and he looks at me just one look at me and he opened the door and joined the other the other soldiers who were now engaging the the al -Shabaab that were deployed in this particular ambush so I was later to find out that we had run into an ambush that was reinforced by an IED Okay. So immediately after my driver left, I reached for the radio because I knew that the, the personnel at the end of the convoy possibly would not know or have knowledge of what was happening at the front. So I reached for the radio and radioed my sergeant. Uh, he's called Sergeant Maina. So I radioed Sergeant Maina, who was my second in command, and I briefly exp uh, described the situation for him. And uh, because now I had the advantage of being at the front, I also instructed him on how, how to deploy to de deploy the two sections because I had one section with me. Mm. So immediately those soldiers disembarked and they joined the, the other soldiers and they repulsed the Al-Shabaab. We set up a cordon. However, my commanders on the ground realized that I was not with them. And that is because in war when you have a situation like that, the first thing you're taught to do is conduct a very quick assessment of your, of your body. So I moved my limbs, but my right, on my right limb, I could feel this searing heat and I couldn't move it. But still, my cabin was filled with suits and the vision was not very clear. So one of the corporals, the section commander, he's called Corporal Kaino. Corporal Kaino, after, after now they had set up what we call an all-round defense, came back to the APC where I was with a private soldier called Langat. So they opened the APC door, and by this time you have to understand, uh, from the injury that I had gotten, I was losing copious amounts of blood, and I could feel my body weakening. And when they opened the door, and some of the dust uh, blew out, I sort of lifted my head, and I was met with this gory picture of part of my melted boot and bone and blood uh, smeared on the roof of the APC. I immediately knew that there was a problem. So Kaino looked at my leg, he looked at me and he asked, what can I do? So I told him, we need to stem this blood. He immediately reached for his tourniquet and they applied the tourniquet around where I was injured, just to first of all stem the blood. The initial plan was for me to be taken out of the APC and laid uh, down next to a tree that was within the perimeter that we had secured as we called the team that we were supposed to meet to come and reinforce us how far are they at this time so by this time I, I i estimated that they were at least 15 minutes out because uh we we were not going to to meet and stay there mm. and so by my estimation because we were five kilometers short of where we were supposed to meet i also estimated that this team was 15 minutes out but as they carried me out of the APC, I assessed that I was still losing quite an amount of blood and I made a decision that if I was going to lie under that tree, chances are I would not make it back to camp. So I called Sergeant Maina, who was my second in command, gave him instructions 
about uh, radioing the second team to come and reinforce us. Then I also told the radio operator to radio the tactical headquarters, which was now in Busar, and describe the situation so that they could start organizing for, for casualty evacuation, something in the military called Kasevak. Mm. And so, uh, as all this was happening, Sergeant Kito, my driver that I was with in the same vehicle, he had suffered some superficial injuries, rushed back to one of the APCs and brought it forward, the very last one. So I was loaded onto the APC with a couple of soldiers and we took one of the fighting vehicles from uh, one of the fighting vehicles with the troops from Somali National Army and we set on our journey back. So essentially I left Sergeant Maina in charge of the troops now and we had the second team that was coming to reinforce them. Mm. And so we started our journey back to Busar. Let me cut you short. Um, we'll talk about you know uh, the journey back to Busar. Yes. At this time inside the APC, you've not realized you, <coughs> you have injuries. You've not even felt the heat just yet. And you're doing commands uh, still in this APC. When you've asked Sergeant Kito whether he's okay, and he tells you he's okay, um, but you're still issuing commands. What is inspiring you at this moment? So at this, at this particular moment, you have to realize that, uh, again, the way we are trained as in the Kenya Defense Forces is that you look after your brother and remember this are these people are my second family and so aside from aside from my training it, it is also a natural reaction mm. sort of to because if something were to happen to your brother assuming that uh, you are close with your brother or your sister mm. then the natural reaction or your natural disposition towards that would be to care for them first okay and so even this time, in spite of the excruciating pain that I was going through, my mind was set on ensuring that we do not suffer any further casualties and that the situation is contained. Mm -hmm. And that is why I set about doing all these things. Are there any other officers who have injuries at this uh, point of attack? Other than you, uh, you say Sergeant Kito had uh, small injuries? Yes. Is there any other officer who had been injured? Fortunately, no. Uh -huh. Fortunately, no. Because okay. the way we had organized our convoy, was such that we we had certain considerations that would ensure if we if we drove into an ambush not not the entire convoy would be compromised okay and so uh we are lucky that even the explosion occurred on my side of the cabin so that i was the only one who was <coughs> incapacitated at, the, at this particular moment so uh that for me in fact was uh, was a positive because you can imagine if i had to uh, take care of myself and also take care of another injured soldier uh, it would have been a Herculean task on my on my end right. I'm wondering inside this APC going back to camp for all this distance and you're feeling the pain in your leg what is going through your mind well uh, there are two key things that were running through my mind mm. at that particular moment mm. the first one was the state of the troops that had just left behind. Remember, I am the commander of this platoon that is on the ground, okay? And of course, the thoughts running through my head are, are these people reinforcing? Uh, has the team already arrived? And I have no means of communicating to them. The second thing was I could, I could feel my body going into shock. And like I say, because I was very aware now of the extent of my injury, at least the foot injury, and the amount of blood that I was losing, at some point I, I was very convinced that I might not make it. And in fact, at one point I called uh, one of the privates, Langat. Remember the Langat who opened the door with Corporal Kaino? They're the same people I had in my APC. And I, I, I motioned for him to come closer to me because I was also losing my voice. So I told him, just in the event that I do not make it, I don't want you to break this news to, to my parents first. I told him I want you to break the news to my sister because I know my sister is uh, the stronger one in the family and this is my younger sister. So I told him I want you to break this news to my sister and then she will know how to tell it to my parents. And of course Langat was, uh, was trying to encourage me, telling me, no, you know, sir, you will make it. It's not that bad. I was like, yes, I know I will make it. Because I also don't want to make my soldier yeah. panic. Mm -hmm. I told him, I know I will make it, but just in case. 
and I also gave him other details of uh, things that he was to do. And by this time, the APC was like an oven. It was really hot. And I could tell because uh, the rest of the crew was sweating, but I was shivering. And uh, at some point, they'd wanted to remove my fragmentation jacket, and I told them, no, actually, I just need more, you know. Mm, mm. But yes, uh, thank God we made it back to Wusar. Okay. And that is where now I started getting uh, proper medical attention. And now you have the evacuation team ready? Yes, so uh -huh. immediately I got there. I had found that uh, they had requested for uh, an airlift for me. So there were helicopters that were on the way to, to take me from, from Busar. And I was going to be taken to, the plan was to take me from Busar the, to Elwak. And then from Elwak, I would be loaded onto a, a fixed wing aircraft that would now take me to Wilson. And from Wilson, I'd be driven to Defence Forces Memorial Hospital. Why all the, you know, being taken to Eloa, then fixed wing to Wilson, there's no way you would have been brought straight from uh, Busar to well, Nairobi? You know, Bus Busar, Busar is an, it was, is an active conflict zone. Okay. And you need appropriate uh, transportation from that conflict zone to an area that now you can be properly managed. And so that is why the choppers had been called. So I was airlifted from Busar. But you have to remember, all this while, I have now started receiving medical attention, which has, by the time I'm in Busar, they've already stemmed the blood, they've stabilized my wound, and then now I'm taken to Elwak. In Elwak, you have a, a medical doctor there also who is just looking at my condition, and everyone is doing their bit in ensuring that I'm as stable as possible for now my transfer to Defense Forces Memorial The medical Hospital. doctor who is treating you at Elwak, um, are they officers from you know the Kenya Defense Forces, or what type of a doctor is treating you at Elwak? Yes, these okay. are these are personnel from uh, the Kenya Defense Forces, mm -hmm. and it's a manner of our deployment. Every combat team moves with, with its own medical team. Mm. Yes, but uh, because of course also of the nature of operations, you find that uh, it's, it's like operating with the different levels of hospital. Mm. So this is like uh, the, first, the first area where you tended to, then when you go to the, F, the FOB or the forward operating base that is LWAC, you'd find you probably have more equipment, yeah. more medicine and things like that. All right. Yeah. From LWAC now you're coming to Wilson Airport. Mm -hmm. For Many people probably in such an incident, they would start feeling sorry for themselves. But I'm imagining as a soldier, you're trying to encourage yourself. How are you encouraging yourself? Um, the journey to Elok, um, coming towards Wilson. Uh, well, luckily, <clears throat> I only had to encourage myself after the journey because I was injected, I was pumped with enough uh, painkillers that knocked me out okay. so I just kept having brief glimpses of uh, of my station at that particular moment so I remember I briefly woke up in uh, when I was in Elwak then I slumped back into unconsciousness the next time I woke up I was in the aircraft okay. and I could tell because I could see the, the railings and the setup on the window and I remember just waking up briefly long enough to just ask for water this is in the fixed wing? This is in the fixed wing. Okay. So I woke up long enough to ask for some water. And before this, uh, uh, before the medical orderly could even respond, I slumped back to unconsciousness. Right. Next time I woke up, I was in Wilson. And I could hear the sirens and I knew I had landed because of the wind at the airport. And I could hear the propeller noises. And I could see the blue, um, uh, the, the, I could hear the sirens from the ambulances slumped back into unconsciousness the next time i woke up was at uh, defense forces memorial hospital okay. and for me this is the this is the first time i actually experienced ptsd mm. because as i was being stretched from the ambulance <coughs> there's a bit of an open space between where the ambulance stops and the entry to the to the hospital and i remember looking at the doctors wearing their white lab coats and we are in the open and I am wondering, why aren't these people using a covered approach? Why are these people not in camouflage? And I sat up on the stretcher and asked for my weapon. Because now my head is telling me, I need, I need something to protect us with. So I asked the person, the, the, the nurse who was pushing my, my, my stretcher. I asked him, uh, 
where is where is my weapon and he said something that, about my weapon being uh, in the armory and whatnot and I remember thinking this this man is not serious mm. so I sat up in the stretcher and asked him where is my weapon I want it now they had to stop the entire process and someone came and explained to me that now I'm in a safe area that this is a military camp mm. it is guarded and that I did not need my weapon and the next time I woke up I was told I had been in the ICU for a whole week you talked about PTSD when you're going in from the ICU do you have instances of PTSD that you have to deal with after that yes you see PTSD PTSD is not just a momentary occurrence mm. this is a process the same way it it sets in it takes time before PTSD sets in mm. and sometimes it happens especially if you experience such violent instances mm. but it takes time before you can get rid of it before you can overcome it not really get rid of it before you can you can overcome this okay and for me i'm just fresh from the battlefield and my my mindset my body everything is set for war is set for battle so my mind and my body still cannot differentiate between uh peace a peaceful location and a conflict region it is on the ready and that is why everything i would say i would do was geared towards protection towards security every time your reaction to anything was about protection every time the worst was a reaction to loud noises because of the explosions because of the gun battles so any time you would hear a loud bang you would either wake up with a start jump or duck <laughs> and whatever mm. because some of these reactions are, are now uh now become a part of you because that's that's how you survive in a conflict in a conflict zone your body has to learn to react before even your mind thinks through the situation and that is what kept occurring there's something about you talk about chaplain and see the fathers and the priests tell us the importance of faith in a journey like yours well faith is an interesting topic because you first have to believe you first have to believe and it is it is important especially for your mind mm. for the healing of your mind when you believe that there is a higher power than yourself then you also get to have confidence that this same higher power is for my good okay and so when whenever the chaplaincy will come and i have to tell you i am a christian i am a christian i would study the bible i would pray by myself and so i had an understanding of what god says in his word about healing about his protection about life generally and so just having the clergy visit and uh, us saying all these prayers making all these prayers was really key for my mental health so this coupled with the psychologists who would come to talk to me i think is one of the things that really helped me overcome uh the instances of uh, ptsd that i was suffering at the moment That's yes interesting. very interesting as we wind up there our officers still in somalia 10 years on and helping um the country called somalia to stabilize under amisom and i'm sure you're an inspiring story to them what would be your word um to the officers particularly from the kenya defense forces uh who are doing this noble duty of stabilizing somalia alongside other forces within amisom thank you very much john that that's actually a very important question i have no doubt that my fellow officers are very clear in their mind about the reasons why we went to somalia in the first place because <clears throat> remember somalia we we share we share quite an extensive border in somalia and so insecurity in somalia eventually impacts on security in kenya and our task as kdf drawing from our mandate to defend and protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of this country that is the solemn oath of a soldier of an officer and we are all very clear about this and so uh what what i would what i would say is just to encourage them that 
we have a beautiful country and more so we have beautiful people kenyans are amazing i will tell you and these are things that are worth fighting for i love that uh, the defense strategic vision right now is mission readiness and it is spurred on by the dictum sharpening the arrowhead in other words we are working the kenya defense forces is working towards training its soldiers better equipping its force better so that we are better equipped to respond to contemporary environment uh, co contemporary security uh, environment which is impacted by things now like for example environment you see this is an area where kdf is a thought leader so i just want to encourage my fellow officers my fellow soldiers that we are on the right track that this fight for our country even though now we have switched to amisom which is basically trying to stabilize somalia it is absolutely worth it the sacrifices that we have made the sacrifices that we continue to make are worth it of course speaking to lieutenant colonel uh, david wando a war hero uh, in somalia now heading the environment portfolio in the kenya defense forces and thank you very much sir for speaking to us such a courageous journey god bless you as you keep doing what you're doing asante sana thank you keep watching kbc because indeed kenya is watching Kupata sikiza tune hii ya Kibeti bonyeza star 811 star 962 hash. Haji umefanya vizuri sana kunifikia hii simu sasa. Nimekuwa na stress kutoka asubuhi kabisa. Na ni huyu mtu ambaye alikuwa anapatiana manjina ya vitu. Kwani? Hakutufikiria sisi watu wa Islam ukaambani? Eh? Ni nani alisema ati wife kwa Kiswahili ni muke? Eh? Na akasema ati handbaka. Handbaka. Hii inabebwa na mwanamke handbaka. Ati kwa Kiswahili ni Kibeti. Huko kwetu mke ili kupata sikiza tune hiyo ya kibeti ponyeza star 811 star 962 hash star 811 star 962 hash Welcome back to Prime Edition Business. I am Cynthia Nyamai. Now, the National Assembly Finance Committee has recommended a 50% cut in petroleum development levy charged on super petrol and diesel. The committee is also proposing a reduction in petroleum companies' profits by 3 shillings from the current 12 shillings a litre. The proposals are contained in a report that will be tabled before the House for debate later this month. In a bid to stabilize fuel prices in the country, the National Assembly is proposing key amendments in the Finance and Petroleum Act that will guide the formula of calculating fuel prices in the country. Petroleum marketers will have to contend with reduced margins as Parliament proposes amendment to the Energy Regulations 2010 that will see marketers' margins reduced from 12 shillings per litre to 9 shillings. If the recommendations are adopted, petroleum development levy charged on super petrol and diesel will drop from 5 shillings and 40 cents to 2 shillings and 90 cents. Legislators are also seeking to repeal Section 13 of the Finance Act 2018 and reduce the value-added tax on petroleum products from 8% to 4%. VAT tax on LPG will also be reduced from 16% to 8%. In measures aimed at controlling the use of the Stabilization Fund, Parliament is also proposing the formation of a board that will manage the fuel fund, which is currently managed by the National Treasury. The fund will solely be used to stabilize fuel prices, development of common facilities to aid in distribution, and testing oil products. Treasury PS late last month told Parliament that the fuel subsidy fund had been depleted to only 3.6 billion while the country needed 5 billion shillings to stabilize fuel prices. 
According to Parliament, the fund had collected more than 20 billion shillings, with part of the funds being used to develop infrastructure in the energy sector. Now, expect power bills to drop by a huge margin by December this year. Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Mantiangi has urged a steering committee formed to address the management and energy crisis at Kenya Power to deal with all issues facing the energy sector in the country. The government has classified Kenya Power as a special state project in a bid to streamline the power pricing and distribution mechanism at the utility. Farm. The inauguration of the steering committee on Kenya Power marks the start of reforms for Kenya Power that include the stoppage of long-term and bulk purchases. Major procurement at the utility farm will be subject to board approval as well as the availability of funds. Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi and his energy counterpart Monica Juma ordered KPLC managers to work with the steering committee and warned against subverting the reforms. And in the coming days you will see significant changes uh, in, in the sector, significant changes uh, in the cost of fuel. You know, we are targeting uh, significant changes in the cost of power and streamlining and bring about uh, uh, greater efficiency in the manner in which these organizations work. The process is part of a raft of measures that the government is undertaking to bring down the cost of power, including a forensic audit of Kenya Power and reviewing billing systems. Um, all stakeholders are on board and the ministry will take the lead in making sure that this implementation is done timelessly and the effect of it are felt by the Republic of, of Kenya citizens. It becomes necessary to do this uh, so that, uh, as we say, we address our strategic objectives in, in developing our country and ensuring that we address the challenges such as the you know, cost of living, uh, cost of doing business around and stuff like that. The Presidential Task Force on Review of Power Parties Agreements was constituted in March this year in response to concerns on the high cost of electricity for both individual consumers and businesses. The journey towards the drop in the cost of electricity has begun with the government assuring that power purchase agreements are being renegotiated to ensure that the difference between the tariffs of Kenjin and independent power producers are harmonized. Betty Kiptum, Prime Edition. Well, just some feedback on that story. Uh, we have a tweet on our page from Honorable Kabogo, the former governor of Kiambu, where he says, the thing that should do is to remove monopoly and let market faces, uh, forces play after opening up for fair competition. And he even cites examples from the telecom industry. That's a story that we will definitely be following up for you. Moving on now, revenue collection is expected to jump by 17.5% in the fiscal year 2022-2023. The National Treasury says the performance will be underpinned by the ongoing reforms in tax and revenue administration. Treasury Cabinet Secretary Ukuri Atani has said the government has embarked on implementing the COVID-19 economic recovery strategy to revitalize the economy. The financial year 2022-2023 and the medium-term budget are being framed against a background of projected global economic recovery. This is despite the emergence of COVID-19 variants occasioning reintroduction of containment measures. Economic policy institutions, we give them an opportunity to interrogate what we have presented to them and, and use that feedback as an opportunity to develop a final paper that we present to the National Assembly. In the financial year 2022-2023, revenue collection is projected at 17.5% of GDP, whose performance will be underpinned by the ongoing reforms in tax and revenue administration, as well as the implementation of the economic recovery strategy. The overall expenditure and net lending is projected at 23.5% of GDP, while the fiscal deficit is projected at 5.7% of GDP. The deficit will be financed by net financing of 2.7% of GDP and net domestic financing of 3% of GDP. You are competing for your resources within one envelope. 
and the envelope is not getting bigger, but your needs, you come up with a shopping basket where you want this, you want this, you want this, you want so many things. The National Treasury Wednesday launched a three-day public hearing on the budget which will inform the financial year 2022-2023 and medium-term budget proposals that will be consolidated into a national budget and submitted to Parliament early next year. I want to once again encourage members of the public to feel free to give their input and raise issues where necessary during discussions of individual sector working uh, budget. Treasury Cabinet Secretary Okuri Etani says the medium-term development priorities to be implemented by the sector budget proposals will include fast-tracking implementation of the MTP3 programs and projects as well as provide budgetary allocations to support the growth of the manufacturing sector, revitalization of agriculture, strengthening the healthcare system and providing affordable housing. Regina Manyara reporting for the Prime Edition. Well, that's all the time we have for business today. But up next, Sports with Karen Kibet. Thank you very much, Cynthia Nyamai, for the latest in the world of business. It's now time for us to take a look at what's making headlines in the world of sports. My name is Karen Kibet. Now, Kenyan soccer giants Gormahia have left the country for Egypt ahead of their CAF Confederation Cup match against Sudanese uh, side Al Ali Miroe slated for this Friday. The team under the tutelage of Mark Harrison traveled with only 17 players. Gor was banned from signing new players due to a FIFA transfer ban last season. Season, Gore participated in the CAF Champions League but were knocked out in the first round after an 8 1 aggregate loss to Belozidad of Algeria. Kenyan athletes have been challenged to embrace savings and investment in a bid to cater for their welfare during and after athletics career. This was during an athletes' general meeting that was held today at Ngong Hills. The Ngong Hills Athletes Welfare Association held its general meeting that brought together active and retired athletes drawn from the region. Led by the founder of the welfare, Patrick Ngwatu, the association has challenged young and active athletes to embrace savings in order to cater for their welfare during and after the athletics career. <laughs> wachana na mbio na kama ugu umesafe depression inaingia stress inaingia another challenge is they don't know what was the purpose of saving some, some are ignorant they are not knowing the importance of saving their money in the welfare account uko ready na hiyo pesa kama vya nyome kuo kiweka kwa hiyo welfare itakupusti Kwa hivyo tunasukuru kwa hiro welfare na tunaendelea kusikilia na tuwese kuhimishana. Mbeleni ya tukuwa na hiyo wa india, sikuwa na hiyo wa india mimi mwenyewe, lakini sasa india angu ilikuwa wakimbie wawe eh, international runners, ok? Lakini sasa wako na another india na muna wanda wataweza kuwa pamoja na wanjiunge wawe kitu moja. Tu tunakuja kujadili na wenzangu, ndio tuone sasa file tutafanya. Meanwhile, the association has asked Athletics Kenya to help in developing an athletics academy in the region. Frederick Muki for Prime Edition. And finally, Denmark became the second team to qualify for the 2022 World Cup after claiming a 1-0 win over Austria. Meanwhile, England settled for a one all draw against Hungary at the Wembley Stadium as Cristiano Ronaldo's hat-trick saw Portugal secure a comfortable 5-0 victory over Luxembourg. And the referee agrees. Another Portuguese penalty. Another chance for Cristiano Ronaldo. Oh. His third penalty of the night. The goalkeeper got close, but not close enough. Now it is 2-0 to Portugal. Clearance. Here's Bruno Fernandes. It's a third. And that's all we had for you right here at the KBC Sports uh, Desk. Have yourself a good night, but uh, the bulletin is not yet over, as I do hand you back to Safina Chieng.
All right, thank you, Karen Kibet, for that. And on that light note, that's how we want to wind it up. Remember, it's Wednesday, and right here on KBC Channel 1, when we say Wednesday, then you know what's coming up. The rave is coming up. DJ Stano is on the other side, already getting it started for you. DJ Stano, a very good evening. Sijini Seme. Should I say <laughs> Wagwan? Sema Wagwan. Am I wagwan. allowed to say Wagwan? Yeah, Wagwan. <laughs> <laughs> Wagwan, that means what's, what's going up, on. DJ Stano? <laughs> yeah, uh, as usual on the rave, expect the unexpected, but the very best of reggae music, big people music we are dealing with. Junior Dread is right here with me, so don't you dare miss out. Back to you, Safina Cheng. All right, thank you, DJ Stano. Right, that is coming up in just a bit. Please don't go anywhere. The rave is just about to start. But from us, the news team, thank you so much for creating time to catch the latest in Kenya and beyond. My name is Safina Cheng Oma, and our sign language interpreter for tonight has been Lensa Odingo. Have a lovely night.